What's up guys, it's me LEGO Paradise here and today I'm excited to show you my LEGO motorized racetrack. This is one of my biggest and best LEGO creations so far and after over one year of construction it's finally complete. There's loads to see on my racetrack but some of the highlights include the main motorized mechanism which allows the cars to drive around and race against each other, the giant grandstand and starting line with seating for over 60 minifigure spectators, the winner's podium located above the trackside cafe, the massive pit stop building at the back, which includes four fully furnished garages and a VIP lounge on the top, and the race control tower, which even includes a little gift shop. I've also installed some LED lighting to help illuminate nighttime races. We'll explore each of those areas in more detail, but first I want to talk a little bit about the main build. My finished racetrack is over a meter long, 78 centimeters wide, and 50 centimeters tall at the highest point. And the main structure is built on top of 12 32 by 32 base plates, which rest on this huge brick built platform that conceals the motorized mechanism inside. And if you're interested in seeing a bit more of how I constructed my racetrack, I documented the process in my work in progress videos, where you can really see how my racetrack has evolved over time. And I think it's really interesting to look back and see how the new structures and buildings have been gradually added to the racetrack over the months of building. So now let's take a closer look at my LEGO motorized racetrack. And we'll begin with the main motorized mechanism which was actually my inspiration for building my racetrack in the first place. I've always wanted to find out a way to motorize my small minifigure scale LEGO cars. Because it's easy enough to build a large scale LEGO car that is remote controlled and you can drive about, because there's plenty of space to install things like motors and battery boxes and infrared receivers. But of course in minifigure scale cars, you don't have any of that space. So using motors was not the answer to this problem. Instead, I looked at ways of building a more centralized mechanism, which would transport all of the cars at once. I initially thought maybe I could use something like a slot car system, but that turned out to be a lot more complicated than I thought it would be, especially because you need to build things like a custom Lego road to make that work. And since I had these really cool Lego road base plates, some of them are just perfect for my motorized racetrack, I wanted to make sure that I could use those as well. So then I came across the idea of using magnets to move the cars around the road. And as you can see, this works really well because that's the solution I ended up using for my final motorized racetrack. And I'll explain a bit about how that actually works. So the main part of this mechanism is a giant conveyor belt underneath the road, which turns around with the help of two large power functions motors and is attached with four separate magnets positioned roughly equally distance apart from each other on the conveyor belt. And this in turn moves the cars on top of the racetrack around, which I've also fitted some small Lego train magnets to, to allow them to be pulled around by the underground conveyor belt system. And you can see how this works a bit better if we remove some of the base plates covering the mechanism. And here you can see how the conveyor belt goes around and I've designed it so it roughly matches the shape and the direction of the road base plates above it. And that's even easier to see if we put some more of the base plates back on top. So you can see how the cars drive on the road base plates as they're pulled around by the conveyor belt with the magnets attached underneath. So as you can imagine, this does require quite a lot of power. I'm using two of the extra large power functions motors, since they're the most powerful motors that LEGO produces. But even with those massive motors, the mechanism does struggle a little bit to pull all four cars around, since you also have the force of the magnets trying to stick together through the thin road base plate. But the main thing is that this mechanism works and I'm really happy with how it's turned out in the end. 
It is made using almost 100% official LEGO bricks. In fact, the only component of this mechanism which isn't a proper LEGO piece are the four magnets attached to the conveyor belt. You'll see that these are just some extra strong general purpose magnets, which I've thought worked a lot better than the standard LEGO train magnets, even though I do use the train magnets on the cars. So it's really only the four magnets underneath which are not made from LEGO. And as if this mechanism wasn't already complicated enough, I wanted to make sure to include a realistic flag starting system so that this whole mechanism can be controlled with the use of different colored flags. So as you can see, the cars start and stop depending on what color flag is waved in front of a Mindstorm sensor. And that's a really cool effect. You can see when the cars see the green flag being waved, they start driving and when the red flag is waved, they stop. This can be done as many times as you want. The cars start and stop every time, and I really love how that turned out as well. And we can get a better look at this part of the mechanism by removing some of the base plates at the back of the racetrack. So here's how it works. The color sensor starts by detecting a red or green flag, and depending on the color input, this information is sent to the Mindstorms control brick, which then uses a very simple LEGO Mindstorms program to determine whether to start or stop the mechanism. So this was my next challenge, because I was using two power functions motors for the conveyor belt, while the color sensor functionality is using Mindstorms. And the way I got to connect these two systems together is through quite an inventive solution. So you can see next there's a Mindstorms motor which is connected to the control brick and that switches on or off depending on the flag color and that is connected to a power functions remote control. So this way the remote control switches on when the green flag is on and switches off when the red flag is showing. And this remote control in turn powers an infrared receiver which switches on and off the motors. So it's a little bit complicated but this was all that was necessary to combine both the power functions and the Mindstorm systems. And I think the end result is definitely worth it, since this is a very realistic way of starting the race, just wave the green flag to go, and I don't think it could have turned out any better. So I'm really proud of this mechanism. Now that we've had a look at the mechanism, we can view the structures around my LEGO racetrack. And we might as well begin at the start line of the racetrack that's directly attached to the grandstand. And we'll start over at the camera tower. This is the same tower which is connected to the LEGO Mindstorm's color sensor. You can see the color sensor is hidden away inside the tower there. That's the main reason I actually built this little camera tower. It's a nice little disguise for the sensor. You wouldn't even tell that the color sensor is hidden in there if you weren't looking for it. And either way, this works as a very nice camera tower itself. You can see the camera has got a nice view on the cars as they race past the start line. So that works out really well. There's a little camera operator at the top of the tower. He's got some controls to operate his camera there. And then right over the top of the tower is the ladder to climb up. And if we go around the other side, we can get a better view of this ladder. You can also see the cable that connects the Mindstorm's color sensor. And that goes away into a danger stripe marked hole into the ground. And that connects up with the rest of the power functions, like you saw earlier. And then I also wanted to show you how you can also angle this camera. You can see this design. It's a very simple brick built design, you can lift it up and down, rotate it all around. But that's a good spot for the camera at the moment. You'll also notice that I used this design for the other large cameras around the track to make them look like they're all part of the same brand or type of camera. So then we'll take a look at the minifigures in the grandstand in just a little bit. But for now I'd like to focus on the main start line, which is represented by this giant red gantry that extends all the way over the middle of the track. And this gantry also provides access to the island 
in the middle of my motorized racetrack. Since when the cars are racing around at very high speeds, there's not really any other ways to access that. But luckily, I've included a small ladder hidden away in the support structure of the gantry. You can see a little crawl space that extends all the way to the back and goes all the way back to the grandstand. And there's also another ladder on the other side. It's a little bit tricky to see it from the top, but if we bring the camera down, you can see the ladder just extends also inside the other support leg of the bridge. And then in the middle of the bridge, I've included five sets of starting lights. You can see how they range from red to orange to green to signal the cars to go. That's obviously if they're not using the flag starting system. And then there's just a few more adverts and sponsors above those lights. And these lights don't actually function, although I do have lots of functional lights in my racetrack. You'll see the floodlights can be turned on. They're using real LEDs, as well as some lights in the pit stop building. And I'll show you those a bit later. They look really good in the dark. But for now, let's just get back to this starting gantry bridge. And you can see the adverts continue on the other side. But apart from that, it's a pretty simple design. But it looks very realistic, just like some of the real life bridges and gantries you see on racetracks. So apart from that, the rest of this area is filled up with this giant grandstand. And this stand is definitely a very grand. It fits a whole bunch of minifigures. There's over 60 minifigures seated in this grandstand. I've arranged them all to be really excited about the racetrack. Some of them are waving, some of them are drinking, taking photos, celebrating as the cars drive past the racetrack. And I think that's a very cool selection of minifigures. I've tried to include only minifigures which would fit in LEGO City sets, ones that are realistic. Although I have included a few Easter egg minifigures, you might recognize some of the minifigures in the grandstand, just from various LEGO themes and other things like that. And you can see all of the minifigures are safely protected by the short fence overlooking the road. And that's quite important. There's also some advertisements underneath that fence. These are just from an old Lego football set and they continue all the way along, mostly for different Lego themes. And then at the end, there's this short angled fence that just goes up to meet the height of the yellow chain link fence behind them. And the chain link fence is also made out of a proper Lego piece. This is a yellow Lego fireman's net. It's from one of the old fire stations, I believe from the one from 2010 or around then. That works really well. I've not seen this technique used much for a fence design, but it works fantastic for a chain link fence which is what I was trying to achieve with this design. And it also stands out against the crowds of minifigures. It looks really bright and eye-catching, which is perfect. And the top of that fence is decorated with different colored flags, just for some nice color effects to add some variety. So that works out really nicely. And there's not much to see behind the grandstands. It's mostly just decoration part of the entrance to the racetrack and the other areas behind it. But the grandstands themselves are nice and simple. You can see some of the supports and just a brick built structure that I used to build up the height of the grandstands. And at the very back of the grandstands, I've included a small entrance which can be visible from the entrance. Just a small set of stairs that goes up to the top level of the seating. We can also have a look at that from above. Although it's a little bit tricky to see, it's just in the middle there. And that's in a small area behind the gantry. But that works out nicely since there wasn't any space for the seating and is a good place for entrance anyway. It's relatively close to the main entrance to the entire racetrack. Connecting to the grandstands is a brick built version of the famous Dunlop Bridge. And in case you didn't know, the Dunlop Bridge is a bridge that's commonly found in several different racetracks across the world that's meant to represent 
half of a tyre buried in the ground with a bridge going across the tyre. And I've recreated one of the more famous versions of this bridge design with the yellow borders behind the tyre. And you can see there's a little walkway over the top. Just two studs wide, but big enough for any spectators from the grandstand to walk across it. And this is a very good spot for a bridge, because not only is this the entrance to the pit stop, and the massive pit stop building complex at the back there, but also the minifigure spectators have a good view of any current ongoing pit stops and repairs in the garages. That'd be a really cool spot to be if you were a minifigure. So what does this bridge connect to? This goes to this building here, which is actually a bit of a two-in-one. So this includes the winner's podium at the top there, and a trackside cafe, cafeteria, restaurant type of building. So let's first take a look at the winner's podium. So obviously there is a race going on at the moment with these classic Le Mans cars, but the winners of the previous race before this are currently celebrating their victories. And here you can see there's the podium itself with the first place, second place, and third place, and the race car drivers on top. So the third place driver is a bit disappointed that he only came third place, but he's still getting interviewed by an interview crew with some cameras. And then you have the second place driver, a bit more happy, celebrating with a bottle of champagne and he's got a medal there as well as the first place driver who not only has a medal but also the winning trophy that's a very cool massive winner's cup so a little bit oversized for the minifigures but it makes the point that this is the winning driver and then i have built a little curved background behind all three of the drivers that's got a nice curve to it it matches the curve of this entire building which I've designed to fit the curve of the corner. It's more of a corner side construction, but it's also pretty similar to the style of the pit stop building behind it. And then on this side, there's some more of those cool checkered flags and a lot more of an interview crew interviewing the drivers. And there's a little security guard there as well. Just make sure that none of the interviewers get too close. This is all happening on the roof, and the idea is that after a big race, all of the spectators from the grandstands can pour out onto the track and celebrate there, when there's no cars racing there, obviously, and they have a good view of the winners as well. But even now, it's a good little spot for this, since there wasn't really much else that I could put on such a strange-shaped building. So I'm happy with how that's turned out. And just on this corner... There's a camera woman filming some of the action on the racetrack. So the entrance to this little winner's podium area is actually behind the winner's podium. And you can see there's a small walkway that extends onto a staircase. You can get a good view of the pit stop if we go a bit further down. There's lots of different details. And we'll take a better look at all of them, obviously. But for now you can see the stairs that go down to the pit stop area. And this area is not a place where the public or the spectators would be able to access, but this is just where the drivers are. And that's a very convenient spot, as you'll see when I show you the driver changing rooms and the VIP lounge. So that's a very good position for the entrance to the winner's podium. So to access the interior, it's pretty simple. All you have to do is just remove the roof and this all comes off in one piece. You can see it's a little bit fragile, but it all fits together. And now we can see inside of the cafeteria. So from here you can get an even better look of the interesting curved shape of this building. How it's like sort of a right angle triangle, except for the inside bit is curved to fit the curvature of this corner. And you can see how I've built up these windscreens as well using the hinge plates for this nice gradual smooth transition. That's a little bit less gradual, 
but also pretty curved with the adverts on the bottom. We'll see they match the ones on the grandstand. Only difference is I just didn't include a fence there, since the idea is most people would be spectating from this area from inside, where it's nice and safe. And to get to this little area, you can just open the doors on either side once you're in the cafe. So this is the where the bridge opens up into the cafe. See there's a door. It's currently blocked off by a chair, but that's not a problem. There's a customer having a drink, listening to a radio. And you can see how all of the seating around here has got a really good view of the cars as they come around the corner. That'd be a very good spot to spectate the race from. Continuing along, on this side you can see some of the food stands. So these are the cabinets where the food is sold. See in the left one there's some nice pastries and donuts and croissants. While there's some cakes and pies on the other ones. And a little area around the front just to slide your tray along. Like this minifigure here, you can see he's maybe a technician that's working at the racetrack on his lunch break. He's just selected his food and brought it along on a tray. Of course, you don't have to bring it on a tray like this guy. He's just paying for his ice cream just like that. And there's some more, more savoury options on this side. You can see some chips and some fruits and vegetables. It's just an interesting printed tile or a printed brick, in fact. And on the right of this cabinet, I've included a small bowl of cereal and some cornflakes that you can pour yourself and just purchase later. The style and the design of this cafe was actually based off of real life, all you can eat style cafes and restaurants, especially with the self serve stations and that type of thing. And also the checkered floor, that's traditional in kitchens and retro diners. But that also works really nicely with the racetrack for its checkered flag pattern. That matches really well. It looks especially nice with the winner's podium up above. So almost done with the interior. Just on this side, there's another table. You can see this customer is having a slice of pizza. It's got the menu out there. It's a clock on the wall. And this door here is just an area to provide access, which would normally be locked for the customers since they're not supposed to be on this area of the racetrack. There's not really much protection for spectators. But that's just a way to get outside to this part. I've tried to make sure all the areas of the racetrack are all connected together and could be accessed in real life if this was a real design of a racetrack. Then finally, in this corner of the cafe is the cash register and till. There's also some drinks on display. Get a better look at some of the juices if we turn around. And a small sink just for the employees to wash their hands and prepare some of the ready-made meals. Oh yeah, there's also a little tiny fridge attached to the wall. A lot of this wall is built using studs not on top techniques. There's only a few parts of the wall where you can see the wrong colours from the other side. But that's alright, it's not too much of a problem. So then here is the staff entrance. You can see this door opens up. And this is where the staff can enter the cafe. And behind there is some recycling bins and rubbish bins. Since there's got to be a lot of trash generated by the cafe. And that's just in a convenient location for them to access. So before we explore the rest of the buildings at the back of the racetrack, let's just finish up with the front half by taking a look at the road and less built up sections. So the first thing you'll notice is that I've designed my Lego motorized racetrack to be a very tiered design. So you have the lowest structures and buildings at the front, then slightly taller ones in the middle, and the highest buildings and structures at the very back. So this means that you instantly get a very clear view of all of the buildings and interesting parts of the racetrack, while nothing at the front is blocked off. So you can see all of the cars are very visible this way. It's also quite realistic. In many real life racetracks, 
all of the buildings and inhabited sections are usually clustered together at the back or near the main parts of the track, while all the less built up areas, the more rural areas, are on their own. So this is how I've done it with my LEGO racetrack, and you can see I've used the famous red and white marking design for the edges of the track. That's very helpful on the corners, so the drivers know when they're about to come off the corners. But in case they do come off, there's some gravel pits along the edges of the inside and outside corners. As well as some extra safety details, such as this tyre wall on the corner. And you can see I've decorated this tyre wall with some helpful signs to indicate the direction of the turn. And if we head back to the other corner, you'll see this corner also features a tyre wall, but instead of some signs, I've placed a, another cameraman on this tyre wall. So you can see he's operating a massive camera on a tripod, and that features a very similar design to the camera at the start line. They're supposed to be the same type of brand. And this camera operator is also an employee of the racetrack. You might have noticed that the employee minifigures placed around the racetrack all wear matching blue outfits with orange vests. So this camera operator has a very great view of the cars and the crowds at the racetrack. And if we head back around, he's got a little control panel as well. And just a bit of protection behind that tyre wall. So apart from that, on the outside parts of this area of the racetrack, there's not much details, just a few slight bumps and hills in the grass. And I wanted to make this grass be nice and short. I didn't want to include any of the grass pieces. Around these areas of the racetrack, it would be well maintained. That was my thinking. And then finally, let's take a look at the island in the middle. We've seen a bit of this already. There's just a few more adverts, some stickered Technic pieces. And in the middle of the island, I've placed this very cool stickered lap time board. And this is obviously very essential for a racetrack. And you can see it's a very cool stickered piece because it's got the same lap times on both sides, which means that not only can we see it, but also the minifigures spectating the race at the grandstand, they also have a very good view. So as we reach the back half of the racetrack, now's a good time to take a look at the working lighting which I've installed around the edges of my racetrack. So the bulk of this working LED lighting is installed within these five floodlights which decorate the edges of the road. And you can see they are all the same design. So let's just take a look at this one. It's out in the open the most. The top of the floodlight has all of the LEDs in there. See there's quite a few different LEDs. That was quite a bit tricky to put together. I had to get some help from my dad, who kindly soldered all of these LEDs together. But you can see the end result is really amazing. And this is a perfect design for a Lego floodlight, which uses some real LED lights. It's also got a little speaker, loudspeaker for the announcements around the racetrack. And then the wire continues along the back of the flood light. It's neatly looped through the Lego ship mast piece. And the base of the flood lights, they're built on these small Technic brick hole pieces. So they can be rotated around and angled to match the direction of the racetrack. So for example, on the corner, these two flood lights are actually curved around to match the shape of the road. Because that's the whole idea, is so that they would illuminate the track in the dark for when there's any night races going on. And as you can see, that looks really amazing when it is actually dark. Even though they are only simple LED lights, they still look really fantastic in the dark. And I'm really happy with the result. You can see you can get some really cool shots of nighttime racing as the cars drive past and the light reflects in the windscreens. This lighting looks really good from all the angles, 
and I think it works especially well considering that there's not actually that much space for the lights to go in my racetrack. I've definitely used up a lot of the area of these 12 base plates, so I'm very glad that I managed to fit all of these lights in. And the floodlights are not the only type of working lights in my racetrack. You might have noticed that the pit stop building also features five smaller lights just to illuminate the walkway on the top. And they also look very smart and also provide a bit more of lighting for the racetrack. And the combination of the pit stop building lights and the floodlights goes really nicely together. I could have included even more lights on top of that, but I'm happy with this amount because big LEGO creations like this can easily become too crowded with so many different wires running across them. When I show you guys some more of the areas at the back, you'll see that there's quite a few wires which I've not really had that much space to fit in. And it was quite a bit tricky to actually make sure that the wires sat nicely and were nice and neat rather than just going all over the place. So having any more lights would definitely be a lot more tricky. Although I'm sure that I can always update my racetrack to include some more lighting if I decide that it needs some extra lights in the future. Another really cool thing about the pit stop building lights is that they aren't powered by any batteries like the floodlights, but they're actually powered up by the solar panels on the roof of the pit stop building. These solar panels are taken out of some garden solar panel lights the ones that turn on when it gets dark and each of the sections on the roof features two of these lights and if we take a look around the side you can see all of these solar panels connect up with some wires to the pit stop building lights and this in turn goes along a wire into a small processor also taken out of the garden solar lights and that just determines whether to switch the lights on or off. So basically they light up when it gets dark and they switch off and recharge the internal battery when it's daytime. So that's also very realistic and is a cool little feature which I've managed to include in these lights. And as an added bonus, they even provide some extra decoration for the design of the pit stop building roof. It's a good bit of variety for the otherwise largely grey roof with skylights. Continuing with the exterior of the pit stop building, there's a lot of detail to see all around the front area of this building. So we'll start with the top, because that's a bit more simple. You have this long balcony that runs all the way across the second floor of the building. And you can even see some details of the interior inside, some of the furniture and minifigures seated inside the VIP lounge area, which we'll get a better look at once we've removed the roof. But for now you can see some of the sponsors and advertising above each of the garage sections of the pit stop, as well as some spectators on the top. And you can also see this long gantry which also extends across the length of the building. That actually serves a real life functional purpose. Above these two garage sections, there's some of the wires which connect to the floodlights. So that's a good way to transport them. And this is what these gantry areas are used for in real life pit stops as well. To transport all of the wires and tubes and make sure they're nice and out of the way and not just dragging across the ground near the pit stops. It's very important that the mechanics working there have a very clear area and aren't going to trip up on any wires. And also you can see above each of these three garages, each of them features an extension to the gantry, which extends out and provides a fuel line. With the bridge removed, we have a better view of this, and you can see this mechanic minifigure is currently running with the fuel line, ready to refuel the Ford GT40 as it's stopped there for its pit stop. And you'll also notice some other mechanic minifigures, one holding a stop sign, one with a spanner, and another one with a walkie-talkie. I've arranged them to look like they're in the middle of a quick pit stop. 
And then underneath each of these fuel lines, with the fuel tanks above them, I've got some more details on the support structures of the pit stop building. So you have some dials and those red things there, there are some fire extinguishers. Also very important for the safety around the pit stop area. As well as small fuel cans and general clutter behind the pit stop. Because this is a working area and there would be lots of equipment and things like that lying around. To keep things interesting, I've mixed up the design of each of these garages and built them to be all slightly different to each other. For example, these two garages behind the pit crew, because they are currently in use by the minifigures, the doors are rolled high up and they are only just the bottom of the doors are visible behind the top of the gantries. So that reveals all of the toolboxes and equipment inside. If we zoom in, we can get a better view of the interior from the minifigures perspective and that's a very cool view. Just like you'd see if you were working at the pit crew of this racetrack. So then compared to these two garages, the one next door is currently not in use and because of that the door is completely shut. So this is a good time to see how I built the doors. A very simple brick built design using the 1x2 grill bricks. That's very effective and that also allows me to build a full size garage door in between two base plates. There's a slight join in between the door but otherwise you wouldn't notice that that is actually built across two separate base plates. Because that's the way I designed this pit stop building is that so the whole structure can be split into two halves and you'll see this later on when we start removing some of the floors. But then back to the garages, the final and fourth garage is currently being opened by one of the mechanics from a rival team. And you can see I've achieved this by just building up the garage door to be half the size of a full one and made it look like the minifigure is pushing the door up. It looks quite heavy for him. So then back to the actual exterior, going around and taking a look from this side, you can see some more of the supports on the balcony level. They're very cool inverted pieces. Actually, they're not inverted. I've inverted them myself using some studs not on top techniques. And that provides a very cool support structure, very nice and modern. And from this angle, you can see the long platform, the long balcony outside the VIP lounge and driver changing rooms. And then heading down, this is the main entrance to the pit stop building complex. The one which can be used even if all the garage doors are shut. Otherwise, you can also enter through the garages. And on the opposite side, just around the back of the cafe, are some fuel pumps. This is also very important to have around the racetrack because the race cars would definitely use up a lot of fuel. And the cool thing about this fuel pump design is each of the fuel hoses can be taken out of its holder and extended to wherever you need to refuel the cars. So these fuel pumps are obviously less heavy duty than the ones directly above the garages. These wouldn't be used in pit stops, but just during repairs, or for other maintenance cars that wouldn't need to use such heavy fuel lines like above the garages. You can see some more of the Octan Fuel Company branding and colours around this area, as well as some loose fuel canisters and barrels and that sort of thing. This is one of the few empty areas where things like fuel barrels would have space to be stored. Now let's see inside. This building also separates into different sections to allow easy viewing of the interiors. The top floor and the roof are behind the building at the moment. But for now, we're going to focus on the ground floor, which is home to all of those garages you saw outside earlier. So with the roof removed, there's a lot more light in this building and you can more easily see how this is basically one massive room split into different areas inside with each part being owned by a different racing team. So they all feature the same basic tool cabinets and decorations, except some teams have added onto these existing cabinets and equipment. 
with their own decorations and supplies. So this creates the feeling that each of these areas is actually unique and actually used by the teams, rather than just being a carbon copy of each other. They each have a bit of personality. So let's start by looking at the first garage all the way over this end. You'll notice this is decorated with lots of red designs. It's Ferrari flag in the corner, some motor oil on that tool cabinet. That's a really cool design for a little tool cabinet. The drawers don't open on that one, but that's made with some of those Lego hinge plates, the ones with the grooves on the outside. Then you have some blueprints on the wall and some tools and a little Hoover a vacuum cleaner in the corner. It's also a car jack sitting there. That's a custom built design. It doesn't actually do anything, but it just looks cool. And then the cupboards are mostly empty. They've just got a few bits inside them. Then in the middle of the support, in between these two garages, the blue and the red garage, is a diagnostics display panel for both teams. So you have the red car on that side and the blue team's car on the other side. These are the sticker pieces from one of the Speed Champion sets. Each of the stickers represents a different car. The red one represents the Porsche 917, one of the ones which I actually have driving around the racetrack. And that's a cool little design, designed to give some information to both of the teams so they can monitor their cars as they drive around the racetrack. You also have the blue team, who don't look like they're working on any car at the moment. They're just transporting some supplies on a small trolley. They have a very cool design of cabinets, some nice stickers, some decorations hanging on the wall and stuck to the wall, as well as a few little details and stuff like that, all the supplies you'd need for a racetrack. So that's about it in the blue garage. Then moving on to the orange garage, it's a little bit more interesting. They've got some of their own variations of the stickers decorating the tool cabinets because that's a thing that lots of people do in real life is just attach a bunch of stickers to their tool cabinets as a bit of decoration. There's a little rack of tires over there being stored against the garage door since it's obviously not in use and a small welding kit that's attached to a canister of welding gas and that's just another simple little build. Then as we move on to the final garage, this is the green team's garage. There's not many members of the green team here either. But if we turn around, you can see the main thing which the green team is working on, which is a V8 engine. That's currently supported on a small bunch of pallets. And they're doing some repairs to that. And they have quite a bit of their own equipment. So in their tool chest, this mechanic is currently opening the chest. I've used a sticker piece inside the chest to represent a bunch of components stored in this chest. That's what these tool cabinets would look like when they're opened. If you compare that to all of the closed cabinets for the other teams. So that's a cool little variation. Small flags hanging up on the wall, some shelves, cabinets. Here's a small TV screen with one of their pit crew or team members reporting on something. Maybe the status of one of their other races. And over on this wall, there's some more gas canisters in the corner and a couple of tools. And this shelf here contains a bunch more containers and paint cans in case they want to do some decorating. So that's pretty much it for the garages themselves. You also have a door, one of the exits, and that leads on to this area, which we'll get to in a little bit. After we finish looking at the interior of the pit stop building, but then on the opposite end is another doorway. And this is that main entrance you saw earlier, <laughs> a little gas canister in the corner, and some more advertising on the wall. And then here you have the stairs to the next floor. So let's head up and take a look at it. Now we get to the second floor of the pit stop building. 
which is also very impressive. Although it is a little bit smaller than the first floor because of the addition of this balcony which runs across and provides access to all of the rooms. You'd go up the stairs, you have one door here to get out onto the balcony and then from there you can walk along and enter the VIP lounge through one of the other doors in the lounge. But for now, let's take a look at the first room that you enter as you walk up the stairs, which is the driver changing room. All of the race drivers need a place to suit up and prepare for the race. And on my racetrack, this is it. So here you have a selection of some of the racing driver suits on display. But that's also where the drivers can choose which helmet they want to get. There's little columns with some holders for each of these racing helmets that belong to all of the drivers. And you have a bench made out of these printed wooden pieces that allows somewhere for the drivers to sit down, as well as some lockers where they can store their personal belongings. You can see one of the drivers is currently suiting up over there in the corner. So that's a very simple room, but it's a good location. It's nice and close, really, for the drivers. They can just come down the stairs, walk out the door, and then walk into the race through the start line, through this bridge. So that's the sort of routine that they would take when they're preparing for their races. And then the second half of the top is home to the VIP lounge. So this is another area for the drivers and the managers of each of the racing teams to hang out and they can also spectate the race. There's some massive windows that provide a very good view of the racetrack in the front. But the main appeal of this area is it's nice and smart. So you have some very comfy sofas, armchairs, a very smart glass coffee table, there's also a flat screen television where they can watch the race or any news. And then over on this part of the room is a bar area. So here you can see one of the barmen currently wiping a glass. They also have a selection of champagnes and wines on display, ready to be drunk. Some glasses hanging upside down to keep the dust off. Someone's left their glass on the small counter there. And in case you're wondering where the entrance to this one is, there's a separate door just to get into that area, also from the balcony. And you have some bar stools where people can sit. And in this area, you'll see the entrances are also marked with these interesting decorated rug pieces. They sort of act as doormats. And then here you have a small potted plant and some very modern display cabinets. That's where they can display some trophies or maybe even just for decoration. So that's a very nice, luxurious, well-maintained area for some of the more important figures and racing drivers to celebrate and spectate the races from. And overall, this entire building is easily my favourite building in my whole racetrack. Let's finish up with this building by taking a look around the back. And from here you can get a true idea of the scale of this building compared to the other structures on my racetrack. This is simply massive in comparison. It's a little bit busy around the back. It's not as neat as the front. So let's just start in this corner and you'll notice this part is directly underneath the stairs to the second floor. And I couldn't think of much else to put in here so I decided this was a good place for the main power generator that supplies all of the electricity to each of the buildings around the track. So this generator is built out of this cool printed panel with the electricity symbol. It's got some controls for the generator on the other side. So there's some different colored wires going into the ground with the idea that the power would be distributed throughout the underground area. That's a really neat little design. 
and you'll see some other generators around the other parts of the racetrack featuring a similar design. So through these windows you can't see as much as from the other side because there's not too much light although you can get a cool view of some parts of the racetrack itself. But again these windows aren't meant to be ones that anyone really spectates the race through so that's okay in my opinion. And then the windows on top they look a little less neat than they do from inside but again this is just meant to be an area that not many people would spectate the race from although from here you can get a good view of the furniture inside and some of the minifigures. And then here you can see the driver changing room inside and a better look at that bench. So that's pretty much it on the very back of this building. And I guess I also might as well show you a bit closer up through these skylights. You see there's uh, made out of these giant transparent 16 by 16 base plates and that means you can't see that well through them. They're more of a frosted glass effect but at least they provide plenty of sunlight. So that's the wire that powers the lights above the racetrack but on this side there's some fake lights, ones that don't actually light up highlighting an advert. That's the door, that's in case the main entrance is blocked up or busy and that leads out onto this area. And this is another garage type area although this includes a very interesting unique feature. So first there's some more tool cabinets with some tools and welding equipment sitting on them and then on this side there's another small generator. It's got a similar design Maybe it's a similar brand to the giant one. That's just to power some secondary equipment. And then some more clutter and toolboxes and fuel cans in the corner there. But the middle of this area is where the most unique part is, which is the rising car platform and mechanics pit. This design is based on real life versions of similar car lifts, and the point of these is to allow the mechanics to work underneath the cars and the way that works is that the cars drive up onto the platform and this platform can then be raised using the wheel behind it. This is a very simple technique mechanism using some gear rack pieces and some of the small gears to lift the arms up into the air and they can also go down in a similar way. And the platform itself is using a prefabricated Lego car trailer piece, the ones for transporting other cars, but in this case it also works well as the car lifting platform and you can see this even allows the mechanics to stand underneath the platform and carry out any maintenance and repairs they need to do. And then once they're done it's easy to lower the platform back into the original place. That's a very smooth mechanism which neatly fits inside of this 16 by 16 base plate area. Next, let's move on to the final part of the racetrack, the race control tower and main entrance. So starting at the entrance, we saw a bit of this earlier, but now let's take a closer look at all of the details. So at the very front you have this brick built racetrack sign to let people know it is in fact a racetrack. And then for the entrance itself, there's a small opening in the wall which continues all the way along the racetrack. And I decided to place a small tent here. So the idea is that this tent would be advertising some brand of fuel. And you can see it's built up with four supports on each leg. One of the supports is resting on a fuel barrel. And that's a very neat design. I'm really happy with how that's turned out. That's made using a combination of hinge bricks and hinge plates combined with the angular plates which creates this very realistic tent shape. Underneath the tent there's a really great view to the entrance of the pit stop complex and the rest of the racetrack along this road that leads all the way to the other end. And you can see that that area is fenced off for regular civilians 
with a no entry sign marked gate. This gate is attached to the building next to it and can be swung open to allow cars and staff to pass through. If we head back out to the main entrance though, underneath the tent there's not much else going on. There's a security guard sitting down on the chair making sure that everyone that is passing through into the racetrack is nice and safe. Then here are some more visitors to the racetrack on their way to the entrance. You can see the entrance is still hidden behind some of these minifigures right in the center there. And then to the right of this whole tent area I've included a small timer. Maybe this could show the current time. And that's sponsored by Ford as shown on the sticker which I got from a Speed Champion set. And then here you can see some more of the bases to the massive floodlights. They continue all the way along this whole area. This is a bit of the area where some of the wiring to each of these floodlights is a little bit more exposed than in other parts. But I've still tried to hide it. You can see this wire for the farmost floodlight continues all the way along the back of the chain link fence. And then that just goes through underneath this bridge part of the race control tower. And that wire goes all the way along the edge of the road until it reaches the other floodlight. And then this is sort of a daisy chain effect where that wire gets connected to the next floodlight and so on until it reaches the hole in the ground where they all go into the battery box. But that's definitely the neatest way of doing things, so I'm very happy with how I've utilized this space. The only other major detail outside the main entrance is this little fake winner's podium. You can come and get your photograph taken. This boy is getting his photo taken by his dad. So that's simply a nice little photo opportunity for the minifigure spectators that visit the racetrack. And then that's pretty much it for the detail around this area. Only thing left in this corner of the racetrack is this massive building which holds both the race control tower and the gift shop, as well as a couple of other smaller rooms. First let's finish up with the exterior. So here are the stairs which can be used to access the second floor. Again this is another space where the minifigures can meet up, have something to eat and enjoy the view from the bridge. Because again it is a very good view of the pit stop area. You can see it much better than from ground level. Walking along underneath the bridge you will arrive at the main entrance of the gift shop and that is marked by this canopy also decorated in the same advertising which I used for this tent. And from here we can enter the gift shop where you will be greeted with a wide variety of different products and souvenirs available to purchase. So over in this corner is a little ice cream cabinet. This can be opened up to reveal a couple of popsicles inside, currently being refrigerated, awaiting to be bought. And then over on this wall, I've included a shelf with a bunch of toy flags, with the idea being that the minifigures can purchase these and wave them as the cars drive across the finish line. And then over in the middle of the store, I've built this center aisle, which acts as a display and a set of shelves for all the products in the middle. So over on this side are a bunch of fake winners trophies. These are just toy souvenirs that the minifigures can buy to remind them of their time at the racetrack. Then on the opposite side are a bunch of the Lego micro figures. These are intended to represent the famous racing drivers in the Lego world. They're sort of like action figures. And then the rest of this stand is just decorated with a bunch of boxes. You can see them on the lower shelf and dotted around the empty spaces above. And they are simply Lego sets. They're the miniature versions of old Lego city sets. Anything car related, I thought this was a good fit for the racing car filled racetrack. And that's sort of like the thing they'd sell 
at real-life places like this. Anything related to racing, and cars and vehicles in general. So then over on this other wall, are a bunch of miniature shelves with a bunch of miniature cars. And again, these are intended to represent a very tiny form of cars. The scale is designed to be a toy scale for the minifigures, so they obviously don't look that much like cars. But if we pick one up, you can see this is made out of a simple roller skate piece with a plate on top. So that is approximates the rough shape of a car in a minifigure toy scale. And then finally in the last corner of the gift shop is the cash register with an employee working there at the moment. And then you can also get a good view inside through some of the windows. You can see this is what it looked like if you were a minifigure peering in through the windows. So this half of the building is the gift shop, but then you also have these two compartments over on this side. So this is obviously just another garage. I had to include one of the garages with the classic rolling doors. They're always very cool and they look good when they're rolling down or up to open. So this garage is very basically equipped with a set of tools on the wall and some cupboards inside. Although these cupboards don't currently have much inside them. But they can still be opened up and there's a little bit of space to store something inside if you want. And my thinking for this garage was that this wasn't a garage that focuses on the cars that race around the racetrack, but this would just be for more general repairs and for any of the staff that constantly work at the racetrack rather than the pit crew and pit teams who are all based in the pit stop building. And then adjacent to this garage is another very small space, although this is a separate room, and this is a very tiny first aid room. So you have a doctor, one of the workers there, just exiting the room at the moment. And then inside the room, you can see there's some very basic equipment, a sink with hot and cold water at the back, a cupboard for some medical supplies, a towel over there, a syringe on the wall, and a stretcher over in this tiny space. And then you also have some of these medical windows over at the back. And again, the idea isn't that this is a main major type of room, that the minifigures would always go to. This is simply there in case of any accidents or minor emergencies, so the minifigures have a place to be treated. Very important to include around the racetrack. Heading on up onto the next floor, the overall size of this building decreases significantly because of half of it being used as a balcony. So that only leaves the other half for this room. This is a office type building because there wasn't any other real office places around the racetrack. And if you think about it, all of the staff that work at the racetrack need a place to carry out their administration and office duties as well while they're planning for races and in between other races. So this includes two desks, one over here and another one over in this corner. Over on the far wall, you have a map of a racetrack, maybe not this one, but a similar one. A small television on top of some filing cabinets and some more general office clutter. And then over on this window, overlooking the pit stop road, that includes a tiny winner's podium trophy. That's a very cool little co trophy collection. Maybe that's designed to be given out as a reward for future races. But either way, that's just being kept here for safekeeping. Then over in that corner is a tiny water cooler build. I'm very happy with how that's turned out. And maybe I'll do a how to build tutorial on that water cooler design. Back around the other side, we have a clearer view of the second desk. 
has also got a, another type of trophy standing on the desk, as well as a spare race starting flag clipped onto the wall. There's also a tiny laptop sitting in a laptop holder over on that side. And that's pretty much it for this room. Finally, we arrive at the tallest point on the entire racetrack, the race control tower. You'll see the main tower is a octagonal shape. That's built using the help of several hinge plates. And it's got this very nice checkered flag design all around the base on all the sides of the tower. Then as we move up to the top of the tower, you can see inside is the commentator for the race. He's got some headphones on and we'll be able to see him better once we take the roof of this tower off. And then all the way up on the very tip of the tower, that's decorated with a single flag, as well as a TV antenna and a satellite dish for communications. Because this is the area where the race would be broadcasted from. So you're going to need a very tall antenna to get a good signal out to all of the minifigures' televisions. All of that is built on top of a printed TV panel. And then the only other detail on top of the roof is this access hatch, which can be opened for the minifigures if they need to do any repairs to any of the equipment on top of the tower. In the middle of the hatch is a long ladder which extends all the way to the very bottom of this tower. It's a bit tricky to see from here, but that's much easier to view with the roof removed. So let's close up the hatch and remove the roof to see inside. So here is the view of the racetrack commentator. A 360 degree view of the entire racetrack and the surrounding area. That's definitely very important for him to be able to give a good commentary. This room features lots of computer screens and monitors and general controls. These would display all of the live feeds and camera views around the racetrack. And then you have the commentator in the middle with his microphone and some controls associated with that. Then all the way at the back, here's a better view of the ladder which goes down to the office room. That's a much better view with a lot more light coming in. So that's a very nice spot for the commentators to sit in. And there's not too much inside the actual tower itself. It's mostly just supports for the structure of the build. But you can see the ladder from this angle. That's clipped onto the wall. And this is where it joins up with the office. Right in the center. So that can simply be positioned on top of this building. And again, it's very simple. It's all modular and fits back in place perfectly. Finally, let's finish up by taking a look at the actual cars, which in this case are a set of five classic Le Mans cars. This will only be a quick look because I have made a separate video about these cars, which is a whole lot more in depth where I also talk about how I designed their custom made stickers. So if that sounds interesting, you can check that video out. That will be linked in the description, as well as at the end of this video. But we'll go through these cars now as well. And we can start with the actual cars which drive around my racetrack. So these are all built around the same basic bodywork shape, as you saw with the red Porsche 917 at the start. Each of them features a magnet to allow them to be driven around the racetrack, as well as a very simple interior that can be accessed by removing each of the roofs. So each of these cars has a small dashboard, steering wheel, and a driver minifigure, which is represented by actually half of a minifigure. To save space, it's not a full minifigure, it's just attached in with a few hinge plates. And like I said, that design is the same basic shape that's replicated for each of these cars and is then just changed depending on the bodywork of the other cars. So the Porsche 917 is a slightly different design to the official LEGO Speed Champions one, but I think I've improved on that. 
And as you can see, this is the only one of my cars which uses official LEGO stickers. These ones taken from the same set as the original. And there's also some of the exposed chassis which is visible at the very back. The next Porsche is the Porsche 956. This is a slightly older design and car. And you can see this features some custom stickers which decorate all of the sides of the car. And they work out very nicely. They just enhance the overall shape. You can see that one also has a nice looking interior with a driver concentrating on the road. And then moving around to this car, this is the first of the classic Jaguars. This is a Jaguar XGR6, and that is also a very simple yet aerodynamic design. You can see how I've attached the wing using a couple of these clip pieces. And that's very effective. I believe I've recreated the original shape very well. And you can also see how instead of just using a ready-made windscreen like the other cars, this one features one of the custom stickers which I designed. And that's also the same on the Jaguar XGR12, except this Jaguar is quite a special one because of the back wheel cover. So you can see the wheel is actually covered up. You can still see the wheel is visible behind it. I've achieved that by building a four stud wide wheel base at the back. And you can see this wheel cover is very well integrated into the rest of the shape of the bodywork. It's a very nice and smooth. And that's because it's just built into the sides of the car. And that just varies it up from the rest of my classic Le Mans cars. And just makes it a bit more unique and interesting. And I'm very happy with the colour scheme of this one. So then the last classic Le Mans car is one of the more famous ones. And that is the famous Ford GT40. This is a completely unique shape to the rest of the cars. Mostly because it's a bit of an older car. Being from the 60s rather than the 70s and 80s and even 90s like the other ones. And you can see this Ford features the famous curved front, which hinges downwards. And that's made using some hinge plates, actually. And you can also see how I've integrated the design of the stickers with the real life design of the bricks. Like you have the white tile with the number, and that works out really nicely. And then the nice shaping continues along the back. I think I've done quite a good job to recreate this in minifigure scale. And that also includes a small interior with a steering wheel and this one actually has space for a full minifigure. So that's another very cool design. We have some good stickers, especially from above. And that's just about it for my LEGO motorized racetrack. That was a very long and hopefully very fun video. So if you enjoyed it, be sure to leave a like, comment and subscribe to my YouTube channel where I build a wide variety of LEGO creations and how to build videos. And if you're after more of my motorized LEGO racetrack, check out my work in progress videos, where I went through the process of how I built this whole creation from start to finish. There's also another video focusing on the classic Le Mans cars, where I talk about their design and how I created the custom made stickers. So I hope you enjoyed my LEGO motorized racetrack and I'll see you guys next time. Thanks for watching.